Hey everyone, Hexlex here, and welcome back to yet another Yu-Gi-Oh! Master Duel video. So real quick, uh, before we get into the meat of the video here, I just want to start by giving a sincere thank you to everyone who's been watching these Master Duel videos, and uh, those of you who have also subscribed as a result, you know, the response to these has been much greater than anything I anticipated, really, which I know you might hear me say that and be like, well, dude, you only got like a few hundred or a thousand views, which I, it, that, that means a lot to me, though. Um, I, it genuinely made my day. I, I say that and I mean it. So thank you very much uh, to all you new viewers. Now, we're going to go ahead and jump right into things from here, which I'm sure you're here for the title of the video, which is Staples. We're going to be talking about staples in this uh, video. We're going to be talking about cards that just hold all decks together, and as a result of these cards being good in most, if not all, decks, uh, these are also some of the cards that you're going to want to craft first. As I know, I know that's a big question, uh, even among like more experienced players. I'm constantly asking it myself, right? Like, what should I be spending my ultra craft points on? Even my super craft points. Uh, well, we're going to go ahead and look at some cards that are some prime candidates. So we're going to go over here into decks where I've got all of these cards set aside and hmm, possibly some future content? <laughs> we'll see. I'm very much still studying that deck. But if we take a look here, we're going to see this little list I've put together. And I'm not going to go through these cards in the order they're presented necessarily. Rather, I'm going to start with some of the cards that I think are the most important to craft or just have in general. And then we'll kind of just work our way down from there. Now, keep in mind... Uh, with any Yu-Gi-Oh! player, there's always going to be slight variance in lists like these, right? Like, my number one, two, or even ten most important card to craft might not be somebody else's. Um, but I think we can mostly, as players, agree on a lot of things. And um, at least I think I've included all the cards that I think could make a list, a staples list like this. Um, if you, there are any that you think should be here... Uh, feel free to let me know in the comments. I'm always open to suggestions. So, uh, without further ado, though, let's go ahead and start talking about the cards I've got listed here. So, if we're talking the most important cards that you could craft, and the ones that I personally think should be in just about every deck in some capacity, I'd start with this one right here, Ash Blossom and Joyous Spring. And the card I'd honestly compare with it, or at least put it at a similar level of importance, is going to be infinite impermanence. So Ash Blossom, we get a copy already with our uh, special pack. I think it was like 750 gems. I don't remember the title off the top of my head, but uh, most of us bought it on day one, right? Where it's the 10 packs, and then you get a copy of Ash Blossom. Uh, there was also one for Lightning Storm and Solemn Judgment. If you have not picked up all three of those special packs, again, I think there's 750 gems each. I highly recommend it, as it's not only a good uh, price for the packs, but also you get good cards with them as well, including Ash Blossom. I think three copies of Ash Blossom should be in pretty much every single Yu-Gi-Oh deck on Master Duel right now, to be quite frank. I, I'm sure there's like some rogue decks out there where you wouldn't want to put Ash Blossom in, but I couldn't tell you a single deck off the top of my head that you don't want three copies of this card in. Uh, Ash Blossom, for those who don't know, you discard it and you negate any effect that adds a card from decks to the hand, special summons a monster from the deck, or sends a card from the deck to the graveyard. Basically, any effect that interacts with the deck at all, this card can just kind of say no to. And as we all know, Yu-Gi-Oh! in its current state, we're doing a lot of searching our decks, we're doing a lot of special summoning from our decks, we're sending a lot of cards from our deck to the graveyard. If you've been watching my Tri-Brigade videos, you know that that deck does all three very frequently. So, Ash is definitely a great card to have, um, just in general. Like I said, I think three copies of this should be in every deck. Infinite Impermanence, I think at least one copy should probably, probably be in every deck. Um, there are but some cases where you might not want a full set, but I do think in most decks you want a full set of infinite imper impermanence as well. So what this card does is, it's pretty simple, it just negates the effect of a monster on your opponent's side of the field, but what makes it special is that you can activate it from your hand if you control no cards. Uh, there's also a minor side note as well that if this card was set and you activate it, um, you can negate the Spell and Trap card on your opponent's field that's in the same column as it. 
fairly niche, but it can definitely be handy. Um, it can definitely come up. It's something you should keep in mind. But the main reason we want Impermanence is to negate our opponent's monster effects on the field, specifically on turn one. Because again, we can only use Impermanence from our hand if we have no cards on our field. But this is very, this and Ash Blossom are very important to have if you're going second, because you want a way to be able to stop your opponent from just completely going off, right? We want something to keep them in check. Speaking of things to keep our opponent in check, I think our next most important staple to craft is Max C. I would actually argue that this is more important than Impermanence right now, and it might even be in our current format more important than Ash. I don't know about that actually. I, there are decks that I would play, or that I would not play Max C in, um, but. Maxi is an interesting craft, right, because the format that Master Duel uses actually differs from the TCG's current format. In the physical game, in the TCG, Maxi is actually banned. You can't use it at all. So, to have three copies is definitely different. And the reason I call it potentially a risky craft is that we don't know yet just what kind of ban list Konami is going to be implementing, um, or if we'll even get... Uh, ultra craft points back if cards we spend on them get banned. We don't know if that's going to be the case or not. So, while having three maxi is something you want for, like Ash, just about every single deck right now, um, it's, eh, again, like I said, something you might want to consider holding off on if you're being very conservative with your ultra craft points. So, let's take a look at some other important cards here. Uh, Lightning Storm is definitely one of them. Again, this is one of the cards you get one copy of with packs, uh, with those special packs, rather. Um, it's pretty much Raigeki and Harpy's Feather Duster in the same card, except you have to control no face-up cards to activate it. So, it's good when going second. Similar, similarly, Harpy's Feather Duster is also very good when, you, when you're going second, particularly if you're playing a deck that's vulnerable to a lot of uh, spell and trap cards. Pretty much any combo-based deck. If you're playing a stun deck like Eldritch, you don't really need Harpy's Feather Duster, and you don't need Lightning Storm as much, if at all, but there's still, I think, good uh, candidates for your ultra-rare craft points. Another good candidate for your ultra rare craft points is going to be Nibiru. You can see I haven't crafted it just yet, although this is probably the next card on this list that I am going to craft are two copies of Nibiru. So this card, when your opponent special, normal or special summons it five or more times, you basically wipe their board and give them a token with the total stats of everything you wiped, which is obviously much worse for your opponent than all the monsters they were trying to get out onto the field. You do want to make sure that you have an answer for the Nibiru token. Um, there are games where I've gotten nibiru but then I just win by killing my opponent with the token. So that is something to keep in mind, and I guess makes this card a little potentially risky sometimes, but generally speaking, it's a, it's a very favorable effect and one that you want to be triggering. Um, another good candidate for Ultra Craft Points, well, I say good. So Forbidden Droplet is kind of a contentious card among uh, some players, from what I've seen in like YouTube and Reddit comments. Forbidden Droplet is a card that's really, really good in the TCG, again, the physical card game right now. But the thing is about it, I don't know if it's as good in a best of one format. What I mean by that is that currently in Master Duel on the ladder, we just play one game with our opponent and whether we win or lose, that's it. That decides whether we rank up or down. But in the physical TCG, in tournaments, uh, we play best two of three games and we have what's called a side deck, which is 15 cards that you have, as the name implies, to the side. And between games, you can swap cards between your main and side deck. Forbidden Droplet is something I would call a pretty good side deck card, right? It's got um, the ability to completely negate all of our opponent's cards. The problem is, for every card that you negate, you have to discard a card, or you have to rather send it from your hand or field to the graveyard. So, it's a little bit niche in its use, in that... Um, you don't always have a lot of things you want to risk, your opponent doesn't always have a lot of things they want to negate, and it's going to cost you a decent amount of uh, commitment to use this card, which is, I think, part of why it's so contentious. It is a very powerful card, don't get me wrong, and it is definitely worthy of being called a staple, 
in, it's just, it's a matter of in what capacity at this point. It's also a matter of playing the right deck. There are, no, there are some decks that you can't really afford to give up cards that Forbidden Droplet wants you to in order to negate a board. Um, whereas other decks, like my Tri Brigade Zodiac deck, is a deck that could play Forbidden Droplets if you wanted to, but I have opted not to, uh, at least not just yet. So, uh, from here we're gonna move on. I didn't actually mean to go by rarity, and I guess we aren't entirely. There are some ultra rares we haven't talked about yet, but the ones I've discussed so far are pretty good uh, generic crafts. I guess another one... Oh, you know what? I, I knew I was missing a couple. Yeah, we got these here. So these I would put as pretty high crafts, Called by the Grave and Cross Out Designator. These are basically your ways to answer hand traps. You might be thinking like, okay, well, if Ash and Max C are so important, is there any way to stop me from getting Ash or Max C? And yes, that would be Called by the Grave and Cross Out Designator. Called by the Grave negates any effect by or any monster effect by banishing a monster from the graveyard since by their nature you have to send at cards like ash and maxi from your hand to the graveyard just to activate them we can chain called by banishing them from the grave and then negate their effects Call by also has some minor side uses, like against Eldritch, for example, if they're activating their Golden Lords effect in the graveyard, you can use Call by to negate and banish that as well, which makes it not only just good against hand traps, but um, it also has some situational uses against certain decks as well. Those two uses combined, I think, make it a pretty good card to main deck, although I would really only consider main decking this card if you're absolutely uh, destroyed by hand traps. Basically, if you're playing a combo deck, if you're playing a stun deck like Eldritch, we don't really need Called by the Grave. The other card to stop hand traps like Maxi and Ash is this one here, Cross Out Desig... Ooh, excuse me. <clears throat> Cross Out Designator. So with this card, we declare a card name and we banish a copy of that card from our decks, but then we also negate that card. So that is one important thing to note. Right, this card can stop hand traps. I mean, really, it can stop anything, but its main use is for stopping hand traps. Uh, this card can do that, but you have to also be playing it as well. So, uh, if you want to be stopping, like, Ash and Maxi, you got to have Ash and Maxi in your deck, which is not a huge ask. We can also stop Nibiru if we have Nibiru in our deck. Um, those are the main three that you want to stop with Cross Out Designator. Uh, I've not played with this card yet, obviously I haven't crafted it yet, um, and it only recently came out in the TCG, so I'm not really sure how niche of a use it is to use it to counter stuff that's not hand traps. I just know from what I've seen and from what I've read that that's the main use for it. Um, next card I'm actually going to talk about is this one here, Twin Twister, even though it's a super rare. This is kind of like... I wouldn't even call it necessarily budget Harpy's Feather Duster. Twin Twisters does have some use that Harpy's Feather Duster doesn't, mainly that it's a quick play spell card so that we can use it during our opponent's end phase and we can destroy their spells and traps before our opponent has a chance to even respond. It does cost a discard, but in some decks this, this can even be an advantage. Like again, Tri Brigade for example, we can discard like a copy of Kit and then activate Kit's effect and start comboing off by discarding her for Twin Twisters. I generally main decking this card kind of depends on, again, how much spell and trap hate you want. In my decks, I've been using Lightning Storm and Harpy's Feather Duster. Though I will say, I will say in Tri Brigade, uh, we can't use Lightning Storm if we've played Tenki. That has come up for me a couple of times where I want to clear my opponent's spells and traps, but I have a Tenki face up and we can't activate Lightning Storm if we control a face up card. So I have actually considered, like, cutting Harpy's Feather Duster and one of the two Lightning Storms and playing one Lightning Storm and two Twin Twister as opposed to what I'm currently using, which is two Lightning Storm and one Harpy's Feather Duster. So, yeah, Twin Twister, like I said, I wouldn't even call it a downgrade from Harpy's Feather Duster. Um, I'd call it, like, a side grade, right? As in, it's got different uses. Um, that some, some of them are a bit niche, but... They're still valid. Uh, valid. Yep. Sorry, I'm getting a bit tongue-tied here. Uh, Solemn Judgment is the next one I want to talk about. This is, like I mentioned earlier, the third staple card that you can get by buying the special packs for 750 gems each. So Solemn Judgment is a card that you really want to play in... 
I mean, you could play it in just about any deck, but it's it's kind of tricky for me to describe sometimes which which of decks do and don't want some of these cards. Um, Solemn Judgment does cost half your life points. Obviously, that's something you have to watch out for. But it's capable of negating pretty much anything. Uh, any summon or spell or trap card being activated anyway. Um, just keep in mind, you can't negate like a monster effect with it. Or you can't negate... You can't negate the effect of like a continuous spell or trap card that's already on the field and activating its effects. They have to your opponent has to be activating the spell or trap card initially. Alright, so next card we can talk about here is DD Crow. You can see this one's a, actually a super rare. Uh, by discarding it, you banish a card from your opponent's graveyard, which doesn't seem like a lot, but can be very useful against quite a number of decks. I'm thinking particularly of Dragon Maids, for example. When our opponent is attacking with a small Dragon Maid and they activate the effect, you can chain DD Crow to banish the big Dragon Maid out of the graveyard. And then your opponent doesn't have, the, well, the big dragon in the graveyard to tag into. Um, you know, it's also useful, it could be useful against like Tri Brigade. That's a little niche, but. Um, you just have to make sure that you're using it before, because the Tri Brigade's banished from the grave as a cost. So, if you're wanting to use it to cut your opponent off from getting a certain Link monster out, you just gotta use it, like, when they summon the Tri Brigade monster. I'm sure there are plenty of other matches DD Crow is useful that I'm not particularly thinking of at the moment. Uh, this card is actually pretty good in Lyrilis Cadex, too, because it is a level 1 winged beast. So, it can be searched by... Uh, the Leerless cards, and if you need to, you could even use it with the Leerless cards as part of the combo. Another good hand trap that I, I actually really almost did play in my Travergate Zodiac is this one here, uh, Cyframe Gear Gamma. So this card um, is useful for negating monster effects. You do have to note that uh, you have to control no monsters in order to play it. And you do also have to be playing this card here, Cyframe Driver. You might have been wondering why there was a normal monster, uh, a ra like a random normal monster in the staple list. That's because Cyframe Driver goes kind of hand in hand with Cyframe Gear Gamma here. So, yep, once you summon it and Driver, you're able to negate a monster effect. Uh, again, I really almost actually played this one in my Tri Brigade Zodiac deck. The thing that made me kind of inclined not to play it was honestly the main fact that you have to main deck a Cyframe Driver. And in more combo reliant decks, ideally you don't want to be playing dead cards. Um, this card obviously isn't dead, it does have a use in our deck, but if we draw it in our opening hand, it doesn't help us advance our combos in any way. So that is something I'm a little hesitant on about. Um, Gamma here, but it is a fairly powerful hand trap and one worth considering. Another hand trap that's. I wouldn't call it power. Well, it's powerful in the right scenario, it's just a little niche. Droll and Lockbird here. Basically, you use this in response to your opponent drawing or searching for cards. Uh, and after you discard this, your opponent can't do that anymore for the rest of the turn. So if you're really, really tired of getting max seed, you can go ahead and use Droll and Lockbird to counter that. Um, it can also be useful against, again, certain decks. Uh, if there were side decking, like I mentioned earlier, Joel Lockbird is an excellent card for the side deck, because there are certain decks that do search or draw cards a lot during their turn, and Joel and Lockbird will single-handedly shut them down from comboing. It's just, again, fairly niche. Another kind of niche hand trap that's also good for the side deck um, is Ghost Bell and Haunted Mansion. Just like Ash Blossom just basically sa says negate any effect that interacts with the deck, this one more or less just says negate any effect that interacts with the graveyard. Which, again, is very, very handy against decks that do that, but in the current Master Duel format, I don't think, personally, I don't think there's enough decks um, that are doing that to warrant main decking this card. But it's still one to keep in mind. Uh, oh, you know what? I haven't really touched on the Pot of Desires, Extravagance, and Prosperity. These are actually worth uh, a little bit higher consideration than where I'm putting them here in the video, but these three spell cards in general are good for drawing cards, and which one you want mostly is going to depend on which deck you're playing. 
So, Pot of Desires is kind of the general purpose one. We banish the top 10 cards of our deck face down, then draw two. You've seen me play this card in Tri Brigade Zodiac. However, something else for consideration is also Pot of Extravagance, specifically for Tri Brigade Zodiac. Um, this one, you would want to banish six random face down cards from your extra deck and then draw two. You could banish three to draw one, but I mean, if you're going to banish, if you're committing to Pot of Extravagance, you might as well go for six. You could, in theory, also play this in Tri Brigade Zodiac, but I think Desires is the less risky cost of the two. Because, yeah, you can send, like, all three copies of, like, one of your Tri Brigade monsters and wall yourself off from comboing. But if you're banishing six of your 15 extra deck cards, you're much more likely to hit pieces you need to be comboing. Plus, Tri Brigade Zodiac is also more of, like, it's not necessarily always just trying to win on the first turn. You do have to think about later game plays with Tri Brigade Zodiac. And cutting yourself off from later game options I don't think is worth it. Um, Skullmeister is another card. Now I'm just kind of looking for cards we haven't discussed yet. Skullmeister uh, is another card for countering graveyard abilities. Specifically effects that activate in the opponent's graveyard. Um, like Ghost Bell, it really is really good against certain decks, but is not so great against others. I think in most decks it's a little bit niche to craft, but it's also only a super rare. So if you're going to craft either Ghost Bell or Skullmeister, it's probably worth going for Skullmeister before you go for Ghost Bell. Dark Ruler No More is another card that's good for negating your opponent's entire board. Um, honestly, I don't think this card is particularly bad. Or even particularly niche. I just kind of think... I think it's another side deck card, right? Uh, and again, I, I have not played the TCG in a while. I'm not speaking from authority when I talk about the TCG. I'm only speaking from what I've seen or heard. But I generally see this card being side decked more often than main decked. Generally because it's... Uh, you know, if you don't know... If you're only playing one game, you don't know if you're going to go first or second. Um, this card is kind of a bit of a risk to put in. Because um, it's, 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 it's a going second card. So if you're in a deck that plans on going second, I think it's better. But um, in general, use decks, I don't think as much. Uh, so a lot of the trap cards I haven't talked about. Because frankly, trap a lot of the trap cards aren't nearly as meta relevant as they used to be. Trap cards in general are just kind of falling out of favor. But Torrential Tribute is a very cheap rare card. That is still very powerful, just destroys everything when a monster is summoned. Um, still a good effect, you can play three copies of it nowadays. Um, and it's only a rare, so if you're a budget player, it's definitely something to keep in mind. Uh, compulsory Evacuation Device can return any monster on the field to the hand, which sounds a little weak, but things to keep in mind are even such a simple effect is often enough to disrupt your opponent from comboing, right? Just getting one monster off the field, even if it's sending it back to the hand. So even though it's a minor effect, uh, against the right combo, this card can completely, like, single-handedly disrupt your opponent's whole turn. Another thing to keep in mind is that uh, this card is useful against extra deck monsters, because extra deck monsters, when they get returned to the hand, they go back to the extra deck, which in a lot of cases is even better than sending them to the graveyard. Uh, and in that case can even get around extra deck monsters that say they can't be destroyed. Well, we can just use compulsory and send them back to the hand. Note this card does target, though, so if a monster says they can't be targeted, this card cannot be used against it. We also have Paleozoic Dynamiscus here, I think is how you pronounce that anyway. Um, it's got a bit of a long effect, but we're mainly just here for the first half, which is you target a card on the field, then you discard a card, and if you do, banish. Uh, again, kind of like Compulsory, this is pretty good even though it's only single target disruption. It doesn't destroy, it banishes, so it gets around that. And there are times when just banishing an opponent's card is all you need. Now, one thing to note that's also good about this card is that discarding a card is not a cost to activate this effect. If we read the effect closely here, we see target one face-up card on the field, and then we see a semicolon. This semicolon denotes a condition. Afterwards is the effect that resolves if you meet that condition. So the condition is we've targeted a face-up card in the field. If we've done that, we discard a card, and if we do, banish the targeted card. 
So if they go to negate your Dynamiscus, uh, you don't have to discard a card. You don't have to invest in that. Um, there's also the effect here where it can summon itself if you activate a trap card. That's more relevant to the Paleozoic deck specifically. I mean, it is something that could come up, though. Um, again, I would call this more of like a, a budget card. As you can see, it's a rare, and most decks generally don't really want to be playing this card. Um, but if you don't mind discarding cards, if you're playing a deck like Shadal's, you know, this card might actually be pretty good in that, uh, even as a non-budget option. Solemn Warning is a super rare. It's similar to Solemn Judgment in that it's a counter trap. We pay some life points to activate it. Um, but what Solemn Warning negates is not only the summon of a monster, but the effect of any card that summons a monster. Note that the card does not have to be summoning a monster, as long as it includes an effect that summons a monster. Um, the most notable example I can think of off the top of my head is Macrocosmos, right? That's the continuous trap card where if you flip it, uh, all cards that would go to the graveyard are banished. But what some people don't realize is that Macrocosmos has another effect that special summons um, Helios, the Primordial Sun. Now, does anybody run Pri uh, Helios, the Primordial Sun? No, it's a very bad monster. But, since Macrocosmos includes an effect that summons it, if our opponent's activating it, you can respond with Solemn Warning. Which is obviously going to be more apparent in Master Duel, where you get the automatic prompts to respond. But, um... Yeah, that's in the like the TCG. That was kind of a fun little hidden interaction you could do. Solemn Strike is actually a pretty decent card worth considering if you're going to be running trap cards. Um, there are even some decks where you would play this over Solemn Judgment. Uh, as we can see, when a monster would be special summoned or any monster effect is activated, you pay 1,500 life points and you just negate and destroy, which is a f relatively cheap cost. Um, and again, negating any special summon or effect is very broad use. Um, anyone who's played even one game non-ranked can tell you that there are a lot of people special summoning and activating monster effects. So... Uh, Psalm Strike, again, not that bad of a card. It is an ultra rare, though, which is the only thing to consider about it. Or not the only thing, but something to consider about it. Imperial Order. So, I actually play this card in Tri-Brigade Zodiac. Uh, it's an ultra rare, again, so it is a bit of an investment, but um, it just negates all spell cards on the field. Uh, one thing to note is that you have to pay, as the card reads, this is not optional, you have to pay 700 life points during every standby phase. So you do want to watch that if you're playing Imperial Order. But um, the main use for it is for decks that either, one, don't have a lot of spell cards, or two, uh, don't need spell cards once they've established their board, which is why we play it in Tri-Brigade Zodiac. Once we've got our Shurig out and we're banishing cards with it every turn, we don't really need any of our spell cards at that point. So we can flip up Imperial Order and deny our opponent from countering with like a Lightning Storm or a Raigeki or something. Um, Raigeki technically should be on this list, but you also get it for clearing the first mission. So I know everybody's got a copy of Raigeki. Same with Monster Reborn. Also a staple, but one that everybody has. So really we just have the extra deck here. Um, these are extra deck monsters that... I wouldn't call them staples in that they should be played in every single extra deck, but... Well, we'll just go right into it here. We'll start with Zeus, which again, we play in Tri-Brigade Zodiac. Zeus, I would call a staple for any deck that plays Xyz monsters. Because as we can see, Zeus has an effect that if an Xyz monster has battled during this turn, you can immediately just stack Zeus right on top of that monster. Uh, Zeus also has a whopping 3,000 attack and defense points, and as a quick effect by detaching just two materials... You can ban or you can destroy all other cards on the field. Actually, it's not even destroy. I always forget this. It sends them. So cards that are immune to destruction or have an effect that activates when destroyed, yeah, Zeus gets around that. So, um, again, obviously this is an extremely powerful effect and should be in literally any deck that plays Xyz monsters. You should have Zeus in your extra deck. Somewhat similarly, if you're playing a bunch of Link monsters, you need to have an access code talker in your extra deck. Um, particularly if you're playing um, Link 3 monsters, because access code is at its best when it's banishing a Link 3 uh, to gain 3,000 attack. But it's also even good if you're just banishing Link 2 to gain 2,000 attack. 
Access Code Talker is not only good because it can gain a lot of attack points, but by sending or by banishing Link Monsters from our graveyard, we can destroy cards on our opponent's field, and our opponent isn't even able to respond to that ability. Um, it also doesn't target this effect, which is another thing that makes it very good. Another card that's really, really good in general is Appalachia. Um, you want to play this in pretty much any Link deck, and honestly, you can make an argument for this being, like, even in non-Link decks, you could even play this as your only non-Link monster. Appalachia is really, really good when you're going first. Um, you can see it just needs monsters with different names, at least two of them. Its attack becomes 800 for every material used. Now, I would probably only use Appalachia... Excuse me. I'd probably only use her if you can get her to three or four materials, that being 2,400 or 3,200 attack points. Um, I, I guess a two material Appalachia isn't bad. The thing is, you're only not only only going to be able to negate two cards. She's only going to have 1,600 attack. So, in both being able to attack over her or your opponent just forcing monster effects, a two material Appalachia is relatively easy to deal with. Which is why I generally, as a rule of thumb, not always, but generally, would say you should only make Appalachia if you can get her with at least three materials. And I'm just going to go ahead and quickly glance back over these to make sure we covered everything at least a little bit. And it looks like we did. So, um, yeah, that's about all I've got for you today, guys. Thank you so much for watching this video. Um, I hope I was able to help explain not only some staple cards that are good in general, but also what their uses are. I do plan on making, uh, continuing rather, to make more of this Yu-Gi-Oh! Master Duel content. Uh, as again, you guys are responding excellently to it. If you'd like to see specific decks be played, let me know. If you want to see more general advice videos like this one where I talk about like deck building or good habits for playing ranked in general, you know, let me know. Just in the comments, just let me know what you want to see. Um, again, we may or may not in the near future <laughs> be having a specific deck video. But yep, I think I'm just going to go ahead and sign off here. So, like I've said a couple of times now, thank you for watching. It genuinely means a lot to me. Um, and yeah, I hope you guys have a wonderful day.